Hello, my name is Allison Miller and I am a Family Learning Specialist with the National Center for Families Learning. I'm here today to go over a, a few conscious discipline items to give you a deeper understanding of what it might look like to be implemented within a virtual classroom or eventually within an in-person classroom for folks that have a basic foundation of what conscious discipline is but want, or wanting to dive a little bit deeper. Um, so today we're going to be going through a slideshow that will be available to you um, in addition to this recording. And we're going to learn what conscious discipline is and the foundations of the program um, as based on the book and then learn about the resources that are available from consciousdiscipline.com. So I always like to include this little quote here and um, it just starts out with what is conscious discipline and from their website, from their book, we know that conscious discipline is a research-based program that helps adults stay calm enough to see misbehavior and upset as a signal to teach instead of punish. It then provides effective strategies for teaching social, emotional, and life skills to children. So conscious discipline is very much adult first, and that's what we're going to dive into here today. I am not going to be sharing this video with you today. Um, just because for recording purposes, I want to give you the opportunity to see it as well. So when you get this slideshow, you're going to watch a short video about what conscious discipline looks like with an older student. So specifically a high school student and with a teacher that was well versed in what conscious discipline was. And so we'll be hearing from DJ Batiste, who is a gentleman that was kicked out of Head Start. He had um, very much a lot of stories that we're all familiar with. Um, of just young parents. Um, he was in a gang for a long time um, and just a, a series of being kicked out of school, going to alternative school. Um, and he had one teacher that was very strong in conscious discipline when he was in high school that was able to turn that all around. Then I'm also going to have you take a look at this video of Dr. Becky Bailey, who is the founder of Conscious Discipline. Um, talking about what conscious discipline is and why it is so very important to understand the skills of conscious discipline. And so all in all, those two videos are going to take about 15 to 20 minutes of your time. So once you've watched those, you'll be able to move right into the brain state model. Um, so just pause if you're here and you can go back and watch those videos. Um, and then you're ready to start back up here with the brain state model. <clears throat> And so the brain state model is developed by Becky Bailey. It's listed in the Conscious Discipline book. And we're going to go a little bit deeper than you might have gotten in previous trainings. Um, and so with this, we're going to address internal states first and behavior second. And then you're going to go adult first, child second. So when you're in a situation where a child is emotionally upset or where a child is in that survival mode, you're going to take a step back, you're going to take your own deep breath as the adult, and you're going to address what state that you're in with that child because you yourself might be triggered to a survival or emotional state. And so really what this brain state model does is it helps adults and children learn to self-regulate and develop strong executive skills together. Children, especially the zero to five age group, do not know how to self-regulate. They're what we call co-regulators. So they need an adult to regulate with them to teach them self-regulation. So if they've never had that before coming to your classroom, or if they've never had that because they've had a traumatic experience growing up, um, they're going to require you to be able to give them that self-regulation. And if you yourself as the adult are not operating in your own executive state, this is where we really need to dig deeper and find out why. So that way you can be a better help to the child and to yourself. So this is the conscious discipline brain state model. You'll see a lot of wonderful colors here. And so we start, um, if you think of like a fist, um, we think of this little part here on the arm as the brain stem. And this is that red part that's that survival mode. And so what we're thinking of here with this brainstem and that survival mode, that's everything that's holding up the fist, that's everything on the arm. And so when you're in that survival state, that's the arousal system. The question that's being asked here is, am I safe? And if your brain doesn't have the answer to that, am I safe? Then everything else around it, the, the fist, everything doesn't matter. It's all going to shut down. And that brain stem is going to be driving the car and it's going to be sitting there with its clacker. And I have my clacker here, right here, to show you when you're in the arousal state, it sounds like this. And you can't imagine learning over this. 
or talking over this or being calm over this. It just doesn't happen. And so when that arousal state is going on there and that brain doesn't think it's safe, it shuts down and it starts to die and, and the body thinks I'm going to die. So that's where you see children having just intense reactions on either side of the spectrum. Because while we have the clacker that goes like this, there's also the clacker that goes like this in their survival state. And that's also a survival state response that's saying, I'm going to die. I am not safe. So let's again, we're going to go and we're going to shut down. So children here in this survival state and adults are withdrawn or they're highly, highly agitated because they don't have the answer because they're not feeling safe. And so they are always going to go to those knee jerk reactions. We want to try and draw everyone out of that survival state. So conscious discipline teaches us different breathing techniques, different coping strategies, to make that elevator go up into the arm and go into the next section. And so as we rise up out of that survival state and we head into that blue portion of the brain, that's the emotional state. And we want you to think about like, that's the meat of the hand that's gonna be wrapped around here. It's kind of like the thumb and like this like fatty pad of your hand right there. This is going to be your emotional state. That's your limbic system. And so that's everything that's covered and within that limbic system, that's your attachment realm. And so the question there that needs to be answered is, am I loved? Am I connected? Am I cared for? And so this is going to be when you have children who are um, acting out in a way that they're really, they know they're safe. Maybe they know they're safe in your classroom or they know they're safe in their own home. But the question that they have in the back of their mind is, does mom care about me? Does mom love me? Does dad love me? Does grandma love me? Does my caregiver love me? Does my teacher care about me? Um, for my own son, a good example of this emotional state has been since we've been at home because of COVID-19, there are some days where he will just say, I want attention. You're not giving me attention. And he's four and he's able to use those words, but the question there, he knows he's safe. He's got everything that he needs in this house, but he doesn't have my attention when I'm on a Zoom call. And so that's really what we're looking for here in this emotional state. We know that we're safe, but we don't know that we're connected. And so this is so much of what that preschool age group is going to be doing. You're going to be connecting with your students and their families in a meaningful way. You're going to be encouraging them, telling them you are safe with me. Here is how you're safe with me. Setting up those routines and those um, different uh, exchanges that you might be doing virtually. And so that's where you get those cute little the greetings and the wish you well that all builds up on that emotional state, am I loved? And so then once we have that portion of the brain, the brain stem, I'm safe. Okay, this is great. I'm connected right here with this like thumb and that fatty piece. Then when you close the brain all up right there, you get into that executive state and that's the prefrontal lobe. It's all of this stuff up here in the front, the fingers a little bit here on top of the knuckles. And that is the green portion of this. Um, and so that's the self-regulation system. The question that we're asking there is what can I learn from this situation? Have I encountered this situation before? How did I handle it the last time? And was that a way that I needed to handle it correctly? And I, did I enjoy that experience? And so when we get into that executive state, we have the ability to take that deep breath back and to go, okay, I'm normally triggered here. What did I learn the last time? I learned that when I'm on a Zoom call and my son is just going crazy in the background that I need to take my deep breath, excuse myself and just say, okay, you were hoping you could have my attention. Let's breathe together, mom has a call. I have to go back onto this call. What can we do to connect with each other very, very briefly, whether it's a smile, a hug, a high five. Can you sit in my lap and we can color while we go on this call together? But what I'm trying to learn from that situation there is why is he acting in a way that needs attention? Why is he telling me I don't feel connected to you? So that we can both learn from this and he can know, oh, okay, mom needs to work. And I can know, okay, Gabe also needs some connection. And so that's just a very, very basic example of the brain state model. You can learn more on Conscious Discipline's website. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing Excuse you. me, <laughs> my watch just picked up on something. Um, so then we have the survival state. And I know I just spent a lot of time talking about this um, in detail, but I wanna show you some slides. So with the survival state, which is in the brain stem, we ask the question, am I safe? It's symbolized by this clacker. 
And we know things that when we feel safe, the higher centers of the brain can run the show. So if we feel unsafe, all that energy is just going to go back down into that brain stem and that's fight or flight. And that's either I'm, you know, ready to come on out punching, kicking, biting, or I'm just so, so reserved and I'm withdrawn and my body is just saying, I give up, I'm going to die. Um, and we don't want either one of those things within our own children or within ourselves. And so these children come to school armored up, explosive, oppositional, physically aggressive, or shut down. They defend against both connection and learning. And so on page 85, Dr. Be Becky Bailey says that um, the way to combat this is to build a resilient classroom. So if you have access to the Conscious Discipline book, check out page 85 and you will get some more information on how to really work with their survival state within your classroom. So then we go up into that emotional state again. That's the blue part, the limbic system. That's the attachment part. The question there, am I loved? And that's what we like to identify as that CD-ROM. And so when you think of, I know they're starting to become outdated with computers these days. CD-ROMs are things that they download information and they upload it into your computer. So you're always trying to download the right things into your computer. Nobody you know, wakes up and thinks I'm gonna put this in my computer and download a virus and just ruin it for the whole day. We really wanna put things that optimize our CD-ROM and our computer and our brain. And so relationships are the gatekeeper of this. So our CD-ROM is going to filter um, safe, loving relationships for energy to flow up to that prefrontal lobe for learning. And so children that are in that emotional state that don't have a CD-ROM that's working as well, they're going to experience insecure bonds. They're going to act out through neediness, attention seeking, aggression, blaming, excluding and, excluding and defending against connection. And so Dr. Dr. Becky Bailey goes even further into this on page 161 within the Conscious Discipline Classroom about how to build a resilient classroom. So again, you have the book and you have access, 161 is where you're gonna to wanna to dive deeper into the emotional state. And so finally, we have this executive state. And so this is where I like to give that, let's all take a pause and take a deep breath because I'm about to tell you something that you might not want to hear. If you're working with that zero to five population that are learning how to self-regulate, they're not going to spend a lot of time in their executive state. They are just not built for that. We know that brains keep growing well into a child's um, you know, 20th year of life. And so at four or five, if they have not had the opportunities to have strong connections, to feel safe, to build those neural pathways, they're not going to spend as much time in this executive state. So this is why it is so, so crucial for you as the adult in the classroom to maintain your own executive state as much as possible because they're going to feed off of you. And when you think about this, the other piece of information I like to give educators is a child will never be able to be at a higher state than the adult that they're regulating with. So if you are in an emotional state with a child that has just pushed every single one of your buttons for the day, neither one of you are going to be able to get to executive together unless you have some sort of an intervention. And that's really hard to understand. And to, it's a, it was for me a hard pill to swallow when I started learning conscious discipline. And so that's why things like the deep breath, that's why things like the, the different routines and the I love you rituals are so important because they bring us back as adults to that executive state, to that question of, okay, I'm safe, I'm connected. What can I learn from this situation? Why is this child acting so needy right now? Why is this child acting so aggressive right now? Let's look past the behavior and try and understand the brain state. And so this is where we um, have a little symbolization of some heart-shaped glasses. And so that's kind of like viewing the world with this positive intent. So the prefrontal lobe conducts the regulatory functions that override the impulses and insecurities of the limbic system and the brain stem. These regulatory functions allow us to see from another person's point of view and to pause before acting, giving us time to choose helpful responses over hurtful reactions. This pause is where we self-regulate, focus our attention, reflect on our thoughts and feelings, and access moral reasoning and set and achieve goals. And if that seems like a huge definition for what happens there in that prefrontal lobe, it's because it is. And that's hard for an adult to do first. So it will be very, very difficult for a child unless they are practicing with you on a daily basis. There's more information on this on page 253. 
if you have the Conscious Discipline book, which I'll take a moment to say here, if you're needing access to something like that, please reach out to me. My contact information will be somewhere here along the ways. I would love to help you if you're interested in reading the book and doing a book study together. That is something that is totally within my realm of um, role at NCFL. So what I wanna dig into here for just a few minutes is the seven powers for conscious adults. So we just talked about it. I just gave you an earful about how you've gotta be in your executive state. You've got to be at your peak, at your top performance when you're interacting with these children. And so you might be sitting there thinking, okay, I know the basics of conscious discipline, but now what? And so I'm gonna give you some tips on activating a power as a conscious adult that's going to help you when you are yourself in an emotional or survival state or when you're experiencing a child that's experiencing that as well. And so these are going to create a shift in the way that adults see conflict so that you can maintain composure and consciously respond to different situations. So this will be your ability to self-regulate and it's the precursor to teaching children those social emotional skills. So remember, they can't regulate on their own. They're going to co-regulate with you before they can self-regulate. So if you start using these on a daily basis in your classroom, either virtually or in person, you're going to see a huge difference down the line. So the first power we have is the power of perception and this comes with composure. No one can make you angry without your permission. And so what this looks like is if you're just having one of those days and we've all had them. I remember in the classroom, there were just certain children that sometimes don't respond to you as well as they respond to either your assistants or your peers or other staff members in the room. We're humans. That's just the natural way of things. We bond easier with some individuals than with others. And so really taking a step back for me in the classroom, it was a matter of looking at and saying, okay, like the only person getting frustrated about how this child is reacting to this situation is me. This child isn't making me angry. I'm allowing myself to be angry. I'm giving them that power. And so with this, I want you to think of a beach ball. And so think of this beach ball as your power. And any time you throw that beach ball in a response, you're giving that power away. So if you have a child who is um, reacting in a certain way because they're, let's say they're in an emotional state. If you do the, I cannot believe this, you know, we're getting ready to go to kindergarten. We have got to stop this. I have said that before. I have sometimes said that to my own child at home because we are human, right? But if we have that pause and that power of perception and we take that deep breath, I have thrown that ball away with my first response and I've given it to the child and he's sitting there and he's like, I've got all the power. I know I'm under your skin. Um, or I can keep my beach ball. I can take my deep breath. <sighs> wow. I am triggered in this situation. So before I react, I'm gonna take my deep breath. Maybe I take a walk around the classroom. Maybe I ask myself, is the way this child responding, is it hurtful to anybody else in the room? Because if it's not, if it's just an unwanted behavior, then let's just leave it. Let's just take a, a, a brief walk. Let's take a deep breath ourselves. Let's not get angry, not react, and then come back and be like, okay, I noticed you seem to be having a hard time right now, Billy. Can you take a deep breath with me? Great, you seem like you are or you want it and, and try to go with it that way. So that's that power of perception. And there's a lot of power with understanding that no one can make you angry but yourself. And that leads us into the power of attention, which I just touched on a little bit in that um, instance where you have a behavior that's an unwanted behavior. So I challenge you to take a look at when you're being triggered or when you're seeing something in the classroom, virtual or in person, um, ask yourselves, is that unwanted? or is that unhelpful and unsafe? Um, because at home, I've had to do that since we've been home with the pandemic. I've had to take a deep breath back. So uh, the perfect example of this happened today in my household. I'm not feeling the greatest and my husband's been down and out for the count. So we've had to be isolating and quarantining away. And um, I was just trying to get ready for my work day. And my son had taken his dump truck and had gotten into our dry storage and it pulled out all of our cans and everything and was just stacking them and using the dump truck and, and making all of these noises. And it's a mess, it's still a mess because I haven't had a chance to clean it up yet. And rather than me getting all flustered and just, oh, I can't believe it, I told you not to play with that and stuff. I had to take a deep step back and just say, okay, was this unwanted or is this unsafe? Because he can play with the cans. 
He wasn't throwing them. He was being age appropriate and safe with them. He was just stacking and playing and using his imagination. There was nothing that could hurt him or hurt us in that process. And so I had to really just like pull that layer back and say, wow, this is just really unwanted. It's me not wanting clutter. It's me not wanting a lot of noise. But what he's trying to do is to tell me, hey, I'm playing by myself. And so my power of attention there was to say, oh, wow, I see you're using your imagination and I really like that. Rather than getting upset about the mess or the clutter or anything there. Because if I had gotten all up in arms about him taking out this and doing that and everything, all he's gonna see is like, wow, mom just had a reaction to me doing this can. And nine times out of 10, kids are going to do it again if they know that they can get that attention, either positive or negative attention. Any attention is better than no attention. So what you're going to focus on, you're going to get more of. So if you focus on the positive aspects of things, you'll get more of those. If you focus on your students who are walking safely in your classroom, you'll see less running. So then we have this power of unity, and this is just a really powerful thing to talk about when we're in the midst of this pandemic. Um, we are all in this together. And I like to remember this as an adult when we're just having a moment here at home where we're both in our emotional states because we're not feeling very connected to each other. Or we're not feeling connected to the outside world. These children that are home right now virtually, they've not seen their peers. My son hasn't seen his peers and it's really hard. I'm not seeing my peers and it's very, very difficult. And so just taking a deep breath and saying, wow, like it's really hard. I miss going to work too, buddy. Do you miss your friends? Like we are all in this together. And that's just another powerful moment when it's okay to be upset. These emotions are okay to have. What's not okay is to have an emotion that's hurtful for yourself or for someone else. And so that's really where you can take that big deep breath and just say, we are in this together. We're gonna get through this together. So then we have this power of free will. And so for me as a teacher in a classroom, this was the other one that just like made the light bulb go off in my head and it was harder to embrace. But this is the idea that the only person you can make change is yourself. I cannot nag my husband all day long and expect there to be any lasting change because all he's going to do is to have a, you know, a negative reaction of how I'm nagging. Um, the same thing with children and with other adults that we have relationships with. The only person that you can keep calm is yourself. You can model this day in and day out. And there might be children that never truly get to that executive state with you. By modeling, you're showing them and you're trying to rewire their brain. And that's a wonderful thing. But at the end of the day, if you go in there thinking, I'm going to change this kid, I'm going to do this, he's going to do that, she's going to be this, it's not going to work out for anything. Because Again, the only person that you can make that change in is yourself. And so once you understand that you have free will, that children have free will, that your spouse has free will, it's a little bit of you know liberation to understand that, okay, so my job is to keep you safe and I'm gonna show you how to be safe. But time and time again, you might choose the unsafe thing. And so I'm just gonna take my deep breath. I'm gonna show you how to be safe and we'll do it time after time again, I will keep modeling. But I can't go into this situation thinking, I'm going to change him. I'm going to change her. The only person I'm going to be able to change is myself. And so then that brings us into acceptance. The power of acceptance is understanding that's the moment as it is. And so for me as a person, this is also another difficult power to um, internalize because it's sometimes, you know, I'm the type of person, I like things to be a certain way. I like things to go according to my plan and I'm the planner. And when anything steps out of line with that, it's very stressful for me. And so the power of acceptance, especially since we've been home for the pandemic has just taught me, sometimes I just have to take that big deep breath. <sighs> this is happening. I cannot stop this train. <laughs> so I'm just gonna sit back and I'm going to enjoy the ride and watch the view out the window because there's not much more I can do because getting myself worked up into an emotional state or to a survival state is not going to help anybody. So I just need to accept that this is what it is and that the only person I can control and change is myself. And I'm going to try and use the other skills in my own backpack to make the most of this moment. And that's just a really difficult thing to do sometimes. So if you're struggling with this or if this is one that just you kind of think, oh, wow, that's going to be hard. I am with you in solidarity. We're a power of unity. We're in this together because this is a tricky one. 
And then we get to this last one, and this is the power of love. And I really think that most educators just naturally have this. And it's this idea that we just see the best in others. At the end of the day, I talked about that child that maybe is doing the unsafe thing time after time again, no matter how much you model and talk. You've just got to see the best in them. They're trying their best. And maybe at the end of the year and the end of your time together, you'll see a little bit of improvement. But for now, a new day is a new slate. And we've just got to, you know, hope that, you know, it's going to be better because I, I truly believe that people don't inherently wake up and think I'm just going to be terrible today. Children certainly don't do that. Um, so we need to just take that deep breath and find something positive in the situation because there is always a positive if we look hard enough. And then we have this power of intention. And so this is another one that um, might just be a little bit more difficult to um, apply to ourselves personally, but we can probably model it a little bit better as teachers. Mistakes are an opportunity to learn. And Conscious Discipline has a cute little song called, Oops, I Made a Mistake. Um, and it's, but I can fix it. And so um, I'll see if I can get that link and share it out at a later date. But this idea is that it's just a, it's a way to learn. And so rather than getting upset because something got spilled or broken or someone did something that was unsafe, take that deep breath, everybody calms down and just talk about it. What did we learn from this? Is there something that we can do differently next time? Let's talk through this situation. And so the next time this happens, model, model, model. The next time that you have those scissors, what are you going to do? I walked in the other day and my son was cutting his hair. And so I had my oh wow moment. I took my big deep breath instead of like going crazy and just yelling. I was like, huh, you're cutting your hair. You took the scissors that we've been practicing with at home and you cut your hair. Wow, okay. Um, so the only people that cut our hair are people that are trained how to cut hair. <laughs> you can you know, have whatever example that you wanna use or maybe if you're you know, comfortable with your kid cutting your hair, that's a, a different story for a different day, but just give that boundary. Wow, you cut your hair. Did you know those scissors are just for paper? Remember, scissors are for paper. We get our hair cut when we go see Miss Amanda or when we go see Mr. Walker. And, and just to have that conversation, and guess what? He hasn't picked up the scissors and cut his hair again, knock on wood, because every time he picks up a pair of scissors, we talk, what are scissors for? They're for paper, they're for crafts. And we just say, are they for clothes? Are they for hair? No. And then I sometimes do go back to that. Do you remember that one time when you cut your hair? That was a mistake and it's okay. But remember, scissors are for paper. If I had reacted in a way that I just kicked and screamed and oh my gosh, I cannot believe you cut your hair. Oh, this is gonna be a mess. We have pictures coming up. Like, how could you do that? Any of those other things, his brain automatically, whoa, she's giving me attention. Any attention is better than no attention. <laughs> And the next time I have those scissors, wow, mom really reacted kind of differently. Let's cut some more hair. So we really have to understand that those mistakes are that opportunity to learn and try to handle them as calmly as possible. And so if you're looking for something deeper after all of this, you guys can check out the school family. And so that is on the consciousdiscipline.com website. And what the school family is going to do is it's going to increase those connections between adults and children at all levels ensuring optimal development and learning for all. So if school family culture is built through consistent modeling of routines, rituals, and structures. So the things that I just went through to you today are for adults. But if you check out consciousdiscipline.com and look at the school family, and there is a school family book that I would be happy to go through with anybody that's interested that talks about what routines and rituals can we put into place that are going to increase those connections. And then they will also go into the seven skills of conscious discipline that's also available on the website. And so this is where you transform everyday discipline issues into teachable moments, equipping children with the social, emotional and communication skills needed to manage themselves, resolve conflict and develop healthy behavior. So that's like the next step because this is adult first. I really want you to focus on the information that I touched on today. And your next steps, once you're comfortable with the seven powers of conscious adults would be to look into the school family and the seven powers for children. And so those powers for children are going to be um, cued back into safety, which answers the, am I safe question for that survival state connection, which is gonna answer that, am I loved section, am I connected section for the emotional state, and then problem solving, which is going to answer that question, what can I learn from in this um, executive state? 
And so I threw this back in here at the end just because I do think it's so important to touch on again, but just remember conscious discipline is research based. It helps adults stay calm first so that you can see misbehavior and upset as a signal to teach instead of punish. And then it gives you effective strategies for teaching social emotional skills to children. And so I'm not going to play this, um, but this is again, you can check out this video in the link of this PowerPoint that you're going to get. This is DJ Batiste again, he's gonna like leave us on, it's about three minutes worth of, here's what conscious discipline did for me. And this is just a really powerful video. It's wonderful. So I hope you enjoy it. And then um, this was an exit slip I had. So in the chat box or for yourself, type one thing that you've learned today and that you want to try in your classroom and that you'll do to learn more about conscious discipline. And so if you have any questions and you want some more information, this is my email. It's amiller at familieslearning.org. I have so many conscious discipline resources. I myself am not a certified conscious discipline trainer but I am a conscious discipline coach. So I've gone through the cohort um, of coaching with them so that I can work with teachers and staff in early childhood programs. We can do book studies together. I can walk you through the website. I can do all sorts of different things. I just can't officially come in and like teach you and call you a conscious discipline certified school. Um, but I would love to talk further with anybody that's interested. Please reach out. I would love, love, love to hear from you. And if you want some more references and resources, those are all right here too, Conscious Discipline and then Creating the School Family. And then they also have a YouTube channel. This will be my last plug for that. Um, if you check out Conscious Discipline on YouTube, you will see a lot of great resources of different um, routines and rituals in a classroom. Anything from if you're brand new to Conscious Discipline and starting out to if you are more seasoned and you're ready to dive deeper into some of this um, more intricate um, connection pieces with the school family. Those are on there as well. So I hope you have a wonderful day. Everybody stay safe and please, 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 if you have questions, reach on out.